Back in our first episode, when we visited Daisy Antiques, we looked at two Queen Anne high boys and discussed the design elements of the Queen Anne period. The Queen Anne style is known for its distinctive cabriolet leg and its four most common styles of feet. The padded foot, the slipper foot, the Spanish foot, and the trifid foot. Today we're going to talk about the Chippendale style and how it compares to the Queen Anne design. The most common trait and most recognizable trait of the Chippendale style is the um, ball and cloth foot. In the adult education show that I gave uh, not too long ago, you may remember me saying that there are transition periods, periods when styles overlap. Most Queen Anne pieces would not have the ball and cloth foot, but with the introduction of the Chippendale style in 1740, and the Queen Anne period still flourishing till 1760, what we had was an overlap of design styles, thus creating a transition period. Here, you can see some examples of Queen Anne chairs with the new influence of Chippendale's ball and cloth foot. Now, should you see this, the way to distinguish Queen Anne from Chippendale is in the construction of the chair's back. Queen Anne chairs are almost always curvy. But then again, during the transition period, the Queen Anne chairs may still have the styles of feet that we're used to, but have a, another Chippendale influence, which would be up, and John, if you follow this, up into the crest rail of a Queen Anne chair. Okay? It would have, um, instead of being curvy, it would be shaped more like this with the distinctive ears of a Chippendale style. When seeing this, look at the backsplat. Queen Anne chairs were solid, not pierced or carved, except for this example. But here, you can still tell that it's a Queen Anne by its curved crest rail and sides. The Chippendale style splat was almost always pierced, carved, and carved on these different surfaces here. And with the, the ornateness of these carvings, we are then able to use this to identify who made it and maybe where it was made. Now there are two other styles of Chippendale chairs that you may not be familiar with. Unlike the prototypical ball and claw foot with the cabriolet leg, there's also what's known as the Marlboro leg. And that would be um, square and straight and may have a beaded detail on the side. And then there's also the ladder back Chippendale or it's also known as the ribbon back. The next two styles we'll discuss are Hepplewhite and Sheridan. And these two styles are generally very easy to tell apart. Hepplewhite first came to the colonies in about 1780. And here I have um, Hepplewhite reproduction, centennial, probably around 1876. And what was distinctive about Hepplewhite was the square tapered leg that it had. This is a square tapered leg, and they would usually either be tapered all the way to the very bottom, or taper and then terminate in what was called a spade foot. On this chair here, we have a square tapered leg, but much like Chippendale's Marlboro leg, it has channels carved in the front, and it also has beaded um, detailing on the corners. Now, another distinctive style element of the Hepplewhite is the shield back. Okay, and it's called a shield for obvious reasons. <clears throat> now, the back of this would be, cur uh, would be carved in many different ways, okay? And usually would incorporate elements of, you can see right here, this is called a schwag, right in through here. And then you would have other carving elements of either feathers or um, leaves and even urns. And they're very, very distinctive. And two of the most famous carvers were Samuel McIntyre of Salem, Massachusetts, and Stephen Badlam of Dorchester, Massachusetts. And now we're gonna talk about Sheridan. The Sheridan style chair had two basic forms, each with many design interpretations and varying regional traits. The first style arrived in the States around 1800 and are very similar to the Hepplewhite, except instead of having a curved back or shield, they were more straight and have what is known as a step-down element in the crest rail. And like the Hepplewhite chairs, 
Sheratons of this style had square tapered legs and spade feet, but also may have fluting in the front legs. The second style introduced two new leg designs. As well as new leg designs, there was a new design to the back of the chair, and it had many interpretations from 1800 to 1820. The first leg style is the turned leg. It's easy to spot, and it's clearly Sheridan, and often these legs through this section here might have what's called a reeded detail, which um, you'll have a lot of different grooves through here, but they're raised. And then the opposite of that would be a fluted detail, which would be um, carved depressions or channels, but they're called flutes, all the way around. The second Sheridan style is the saber leg, and it's named for its sword-like appearance. Here you can see some of the many interpretations of the backs of Sheraton chairs. Two of the most recognizable are the X-back style, fashioned in New York, and the lyre back, attributed to Duncan Fife. Fife also added what is called the hairy paw carving to the front legs of some of his Sheraton chairs. Now these Sheraton chairs and case pieces are often also known as federal pieces or coming from a federal period. But the term federal actually comes from when our government reshaped itself into a federal government. So the pieces that are called federal refer to this period of time and only refer to those Sheraton pieces made here in the United States.